Greetings from the great state of Alaska. My name is Dr. G, and today I want to share with you a message of hope. You know, last week we talked about judgment. We said that judgment is inevitable. It cannot be stopped. God is going to judge this world. God is going to judge the United States of America. You know, it says in Hebrews 9.27 that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. You see, we're going to die, and then we're going to face judgment. It's inevitable. We also talked last week about Babylon, how Babylon represents the worldwide global anti-God system. And some of the characteristics of Babylon is rejection, rejecting God, rejecting God's plan of salvation, rejecting God's Holy Spirit. Fornication is another characteristic of Babylon. Fornication, pride, and arrogance. It's another characteristic. And the last one is rebellion. It's not simply rejecting God. It's rebelling completely against His authority and His Lordship as Creator over the created world. And so today what I want to do is talk to you about judgment and what judgment's going to look like in terms of, of, of a descriptive uh, nature. And so, number one, let me just say that judgment involves the Son. So if you're taking notes, judgment involves the Son. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's turn to Scripture. If you have your Bibles, if you turn to Acts chapter 17, verse 31, it says that God has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance this of this to all by raising Him from the dead. So we know that that passage of Scripture, Paul is talking about Jesus, the Son of God, whom God raised from the dead. So judgment is going to involve the Son. Let's turn to John chapter 5, verse 22. Now this is, actually we'll go to verse 21 and 22. This is Jesus talking. Jesus says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom He will. Verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but He has committed all judgment to the Son. Once again, judgment is going to involve Jesus. Jesus is going to sit as the judge. I think it's interesting that Jesus <laughs> is also the Savior, but we're going to get to that. Jesus, as the Son, is the agent of judgment. Number two, judgment involves separation. Judgment involves separation. I hope you can read my notes. Uh, when I talk about separation, I think we're best to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31. It says here, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. Well, what kind of people sit on a throne? Well, judges and kings, right? It says here in verse 32, All the nations will be gathered in His presence, and He will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at His right hand, and He will place the goats at His left hand. As we can see here, judgment indeed involves a separation. And it's going to be a fair separation. It's going to be a fair separation because the judge, the Son, is completely fair and just. And so when He looks 
and he begins to separate, his judgment is accurate. Amen? Number three, judgment involves secrets. How many have a secret? Probably all of us have a secret. Amen? All of us have a secret. There's something we know that someone else in our family doesn't know or something we know that a friend doesn't know or that a co-worker. But let me just say that God knows everything. Okay? God knows everything. I want to turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2. Verse 16, chapter 2, verse 16 in the book of Romans. And this is the Apostle Paul. Paul says, This is the message that I proclaim, that the day is coming when God, through Jesus Christ, through the Son, will judge everyone's secret life. Everyone's secret life. Now we could look at some other scriptures and they go right along with this. Uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 42. It says that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all the living and the dead. So just because you die, you might think you're taking your secrets to the grave. But rest assured, Jesus Christ knows everything and that's why he's a righteous judge and you know I, I hate for these discussions to get political sometimes but sometimes you can't help it there's there's a lot of things going on in our government right now we see president <laughs> it's hard to say that president biden it's hard to say it because i still don't believe it we see him signing all these executive orders and i watched a clip where he was getting ready to sign something and he was surrounded by a group of his people in his administration, and he said, I don't know what I'm signing. And one of the gals came up behind him, and you could hear her on the mic. She said, sign it anyway. Just sign it anyway. You know, we don't know what's happening in our federal government, but we know that it's not right. There's some secrets, some bad secrets that God is going to expose one of these days, if not in our own lifetime, if not in the next few months. So let's just stop there. God, or judgment involves secrets. The next one I want to look at is sincerity. Judgment involves sincerity. How many know what that word means, sincerity? It kind of has this ring of honesty to it, or or transparency, or, or being genuine, being sincere. I want to look in the book of Matthew. Let me see, chapter, uh, get the right book here, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. You know, this would be a terrible place to be. You know, you, you can't be a pretender. You can't pretend to be serving God. You can't show up at church all dressed up carrying your Bible, sitting on the front pew, even maybe raising your hands to some worship songs. And then the rest of the week, ignore God's commands. 
You can't do that on Sunday and then the rest of the week. Lock up the Holy Spirit. Lock him in a closet and put handcuffs on him. You can't do that. You can't grieve the Holy Spirit and expect to stand in front of God someday and say, well, I did all these things in your name. Judgment involves sincerity. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. It says, For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. Or other versions say the house of God. In other words, judgment is going to start with the church. Judgment is going to start with the house of God. And this, this is really bothersome to me. As I read the news and as I see what's going on and I see there's a division in our nation. There's a political division, but there's also a division within the church. There's the real church and then there's this imitation. There's this fake. There's this church that is not really the church. We see it in, in, in Christians. We see people who profess to be Christians who love the Lord. But then their actions go the other way. Let me read a scripture. This is in the book of Isaiah. The, the Lord laid this upon my heart a little bit earlier today. And, and so I thought when I would deliver this message of hope that I would refer to this scripture. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Those who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And then there's many more things that talk about these woe statements. You see, when I read the word woe, I immediately think that there's judgment coming. There's judgment coming. When, when we see in the Bible, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's a scary place to be. Because you're not thinking in a godlike fashion. You're not thinking with the mind of Christ if you're calling something evil good and something good evil. You're not thinking the way Jesus would think. Your mind is warped. You have the mind and the heart of the world if you're calling good evil and evil good. You see, judgment is going to start with the body of Christ. So today as we look at this list, this is a pretty good list of descriptions of judgment what it's going to look like. But today I want to share one last thing with you as it relates to judgment. Salvation. Salvation. How does salvation factor into this time of judgment that's coming? How, how does salvation factor in? And so I think first of all, we have to admit but we're all guilty we're all guilty of sin Romans 3 23 it says there's none righteous no not one all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory I believe it's Romans 3 10 and Romans 3 23 you see there's none of us who can stand and and say that we're innocent on the day of judgment we're all guilty in our present condition. We are guilty. We're guilty of sin. But you know, Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. And so on Judgment Day, if you're guilty of sin, you're going to get death. But the second part of that verse says, The gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through the Son. You see, the Son... He's the judge. <clears throat> but He's also the Savior. 
He's not just the agent of judgment, but He's the agent of salvation. He's going to bring judgment. But He's already brought salvation. In John chapter 1, verse 12, as many as received Him and believed upon His name, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to become the sons and daughters of God. You see, Jesus, He's our judge, but He's also our Savior. You see, when Jesus gave His life for us, and, and the Scripture says that, Jesus said, no one takes my life. I give it willingly. You see, Jesus willingly gave His life to pay the penalty for our sin. It says, I believe in 1 Corinthians, He became sin, who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. You see, there's this transfer that takes place. And so number one, today you have to admit that you're a sinner. I'm, I'm telling you how to be saved. I'm telling you how to be standing on the right side when judgment comes, when there's that separate. I'm telling you how to be saved. Number one, admit you're a sinner. Amen? Number two, we must believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and that He raised from the dead three days later. You see, He conquered death, hell, and the grave. That's eternity. Jesus triumphed, and His victory will become our victory. Number three, we have to make Jesus our Lord. You know, when, when you call somebody Lord, you're, you're saying Master. I've been telling my kids this. When you refer to Jesus Christ and you say, Oh Lord, that's like saying, Oh Master. And people who say that are servants. You see, when we become saved, we're no longer serving the interest of this flesh. We're no longer serving the anti-Christ, anti-God system. We are serving the Son of God. We are serving Jesus Christ. Amen. We have to become servants of His. You know, it says in the book of Romans, I believe in chapter 10, verse 9, we can look there quickly. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you have your Bibles. It says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, in other words, if you say, He's my Lord, I'm serving Him, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, like I said, there's a lot of fakes in the church. There's a lot of fakes, a lot of pretenders. And only God knows what's in your heart. You know, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. So today, <clears throat> begin to take account of where your heart is at. Are you serving the Lord in word? Or are you serving the Lord in word and deed? And it's from a heart that has been redeemed. Amen. Let me pray with you today as we conclude our discussion on judgment. Precious Jesus, we're so thankful today, Lord, that we can call you Savior, knowing that one of these days you're going to be standing, or that we're going to be standing in front of you, and that you're going to judge us. You're going to look at us. You're going to evaluate us. You're going to look upon our heart. And Lord, we're going to give an account to you on that day of judgment. Lord, we know that on that day there's going to be a separation. And Lord, we want to be found on the right side of judgment. Lord, we want to find grace in your eyes, Lord. Lord, we want you to recognize us on the day of judgment. We don't want you to say, I, I don't know you. I don't recognize you. Get away from me. Depart from me. But Lord, we want to hear you say, I know you. <laughs> We've spent a lot of time together. A lot of those hours in the middle of the night. We've spent a lot of time together. I know you. <laughs> well done. And Lord, you welcome us into that eternal home that you've prepared for us. Lord, we're thankful today that you look upon us and you know if we're being sincere. You know if we're being real or if we're putting on a show. You know the secrets. You know all the secret things we've done and said. And so Lord, today as we come before you and we proclaim salvation, we say, yes, Lord, yes, save me. 
We reveal all our secrets to you. You already know our secrets, but we reveal them to you. We want to get it off our chest. Lord, we want to get that burden in front of you and get it under the blood. Lord, I just pray for those who are watching and listening today. I just pray a blessing over them as they listen to this message, Lord, that they would have hope. Hope in salvation. Hope in eternity. Hope in the Son of God who's going to be our judge. Lord, no matter what the conditions look like here on earth and here in our nation, God, that we would look to you and know that the conditions of heaven are just right. Lord, we love you today. We love you. We serve you. We want to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.